Angela, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. Uh, Brian Holland. In court, they make you spell your last name, so H-O-L-L-A-N-D. Um, I am currently employed with the Boise Police Department. Uh, I am a 20-year uh, officer, so a corporal. Uh, corporal is a time on. Uh, you know, we have a 15-year corporal and a 20-year corporal, so I'm a 20-year corporal uh, coming up in a couple months. Um, but uh, I guess start from the beginning. I uh, never thought I'd be a police officer, uh, really ever. So I grew up in Southern California, uh, North Palm Springs. Uh, I know Palm Springs gets the rap for uh, being kind of ritzy and rich. Uh, I was far from that. Uh, North Palm Springs, we call it the North End, is the black part of town. They kind of crowd everybody into uh, used to be an Indian reservation. Um, actually, they were on the other side of Highway 111. And then there's actually a big, I can't remember the name of it now, but there's a big uh, bill in California now challenging uh, the forced move of hundreds of black people uh, from the reservation to another part of town just across the way, uh, Gateway Hill. Um, that's where I came up, um, largely black, very uh, uh, crack infested, um, violent uh, gang, um, gang infested. Uh, my father was a, a crack addict, uh, mother put up with him for as long as she could. Black father, very black father. Um, mother's very white, uh, German. My father's family, our Holland name comes from uh, East Texas. So Holland's Quarters, which is a slave compound uh, in obviously the 1700s. Uh, and the Holland name comes from the slave owners. Uh, and then at emancipation, uh, the slave owners turned over the Holland's Quarters, I think it's 600 acres uh, to the slave, to the slaves. So uh, apparently I have some land down there, but my father's too cracked out to know. Uh, so uh, I'll have to figure that out another time. But I uh, just went and visited for the, when hadn't been there in 45 years. But anyway, so that's, that's our family all migrated to Southern California, uh, Long Beach and Palm Springs. Um, so grew up around that. Uh, Moved to another neighborhood uh, later in life, uh, towards junior high, um, but was still heavily influenced by uh, family members who were incarcerated or uh, gang members, um, Crip gang members. Uh, so they influenced how you dressed, uh, how you spoke, how you who you hung out with, uh, where you could go, where you could go, things like that. Um, not that I was a gang member. Um, uh, by any means, I was saved by uh, football. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, anywhere I went, you know, it was how I dressed, uh, wearing an abundance of blue clothing or something like that, uh, with cousins who were actual crib gang members, um, uh, been shot at, uh, stabbed uh, in the fight. Uh, There's a largely Hispanic population there too, so very uh combative with the black population um the common adage is black and brown don't get down so it's uh they'll be cool to a certain degree uh but as soon as you want to date one of their sisters or daughters or something you're automatic that's the most racism i've ever experienced is when you try to date a hispanic woman uh you become a a, a nigger in a heartbeat i mean that's that's what they they go off so that's that's kind of how it came up <clears throat> But never thought about uh, ever being a police officer. Actually had a good contact or two with police uh, that were very positive. Uh, saw something in me that I, I didn't know, you know, that they, why? Uh, but, <clears throat> but then we also had uh, a couple negative, you know, uh, impacts from officers that, uh, you know, kind of fed into that stereotype. Uh, even black officer, uh, it was a it was a black officer that did not like anybody from Gateway and let you know it pretty pretty hard. So uh, when the movie uh, Boys in the Hood came out and they had that black officer in that 
that you know who hated the gang members, you know, from Crenshaw in that area. Uh, we all yelled at the screen, you know, that, that officer. I think it was Powell was his name. I can't remember. But <clears throat> so net kind of a, this negative impact. What I did have more positive impact from was uh, probation officers. I, you know, probation officers were kind of in, intertwined in our life. You know, my uncles, my cousins, my dad, you know, they'd be, they'd, they'd know your grandmother, they'd know your mom, they'd know, you know, they know everybody. Sit down, have coffee. You know, they seemed more um, long-term and more uh, in-depth with uh, kind of the family fabric. That had a little uh, piece of me, you know. So when I, when I started playing football, I didn't start playing until ninth grade. Um, and was able to, uh, got a scholarship offer out of high school, didn't like it because uh, I had dreams of being in the Pac-10 at that time. So I went to a junior college uh, right there in, in Palm Desert, California. And, uh, and that's when I first got a taste of uh, maybe probation work would be my, where I would go with, with my career. Um, so I accepted a scholarship to Idaho State University. Um, I was gonna do criminal justice, but they didn't have a criminal justice program. So I did social work uh, with an emphasis on criminal justice, which I kind of liked that I did that. It was kind of, uh, um, I think it was more, it broadened me out more. It wasn't you know strictly this law enforcement deal. It was a lot more about social programs and, and things of that nature. Uh, graduated from Idaho State uh, after playing ball. Uh, had my dreams of NFL like anybody else, but that went kaput. Uh, a couple tryouts here and there. And then uh, decided I need to get the absolute hell out of Pocatello. I could not stand that. Why I went there in the first place, I don't know. It was negative 10 when I first got my scholarship there. And I come from Cal I mean, January of 1992. I land in Pocatello, negative 10. I got a Raiders bomber jacket. Uh, and that's it. Um, and, and it was 70 degrees in, in Palm Springs. So I had a 90 degree or 80 degree, uh, swing, uh, funny story. So my mother, you know, my father, I had, I had have no relationship with my father. He took off. The last memory I had of him was he, uh, jumped in a crackhead's truck after he put hands on my mother and then drove off uh, and me crying going, no, don't. You know, anyway. Uh, then he was off and on from there. Uh, so my mother uh, ends up rekindling a old high school relationship. Just so happens this uh, dude is in prison uh, and he's white. So uh, come to find out he's in prison for murder. Um, uh, good dude, but I could never go visit him because those, there's color rules uh, in prison. So. Uh, my mom's little black kids couldn't go see her husband. That would cause him some drama. Um, he was actually pretty big wig in the gang world in, in prison. Uh, they call gangs in prison cars. So he was the uh, leader of the white car uh, in uh, Tracy Penitentiary, way up north. So all that to be said that when I go to college now in Idaho, my mother gives me my first big jacket that I've ever had. Big old like Carhartt type jacket, you know, furry in the middle, very good jacket, uh, that hard uh, camera, like canvas on the outside. Uh, I go, thank you, this is awesome. Man. So I'm walking the streets of Pocatello, the campus of Idaho State uh, with a LA Kings hat on and this big jacket. And I have the, uh, the collar up because I'm uh, cold. My nose hairs are frozen, never had that happen before in my life. And I go to this big auditorium for a, some social work class, can't remember what it was. And everybody's grabbing, they're either clutching their purse or you know moving to the side. We had to partner up, couldn't find a partner. And I'm starting to get this feeling like, man, if people just don't like me around here. Like it, it was weird, you know, is it the LA Kings hat? Is it, you know, I didn't think it was my color. I'm pretty light skinned for, I mean, who know, they don't know what I am pretty much. And I take my jacket off, first time I'd ever seen with the lapel up, and it says Tracy Penitentiary on the back of the, of the lapel. <laughs> so everybody thinks I'm like this transplant from California prison or something, I don't know. Anyway, I said, thanks a lot, Ma. Thanks for telling me that uh, you know this is a Tracy Penitentiary jacket. 
so anyway, I go to school and do my thing, graduate, um, and I got to get the hell out of Pocatello. So I, I, I need a city. My mother says, don't come back uh, to Southern California. I just had, I'd, I'd lost, lost an ex-girlfriend, got shot in the head uh, in a gang drive-by uh, while she was holding her kid, as a matter of fact. Uh, a guy I played ball with in high school, a uh, close friend, went to UCLA, uh, got shot in the head, banning Californian. Um, it was just bad. And so she's like, don't, don't come back here. You know, go somewhere else. So she, uh, so I, I, at that point I put in, uh, applications for different jobs, Salt Lake city and Boise, those are the two closest cities. I, I wanted a city. Uh, and so I, I, I got a job. First job offered to me was Canyon County Juvenile Probation, uh, right here in Caldwell, uh, Doug Brown. He started my, my, my career. He was the chief, chief probation officer at the time. Very good friend of mine now. Very, very good friend. Uh, he gave, took a chance on me, he gave me a job and I started that job in, uh, 1996 and, uh, did that for three years in Canyon County at the height of the gang warfare in that area. So I didn't know at the time that that was such a thing in Idaho, but, uh, Canyon County had a legit gang problem. I mean, West side Lomas, East side Locos, Northaniels, you know, all Hispanic gangs for the most part. And they were killing each other left and right, shooting each other. Kids were shooting each other left and right. So I started my gang, excuse me, my, um, kind of my gang, track at that point i knew i could do it because i'd come from that neighborhood and i understand understood gang norms gang uh ways gang identification all that kind of stuff i could speak it i could i could, I could act it i could do all that stuff so as a juvie po uh, they quickly made me kind of on the intensive supervision unit uh, the hardest kids that I wanted that challenge. So, so I was, I had kids who were shooters, stabbers. I mean, uh, they were helping their parents sell dope connected to cartel rings and you name it. And I was, I was waving kids into adult court. I was in a two person unit on a, on a heavily intensive supervision model. And I, at that point I wanted to do something more on the gang identification side of things and intervention if possible uh, because I believe that's a huge part of uh, policing is intervening stopping crime uh, and so I, I, I started to get into uh, kind of the intel part of it and started calling some meetings together with Canyon County and uh, sheriffs and Caldwell PD and our unit and some other units to, to, to kind of quell some of the violence that was happening so, you know, I'd offer services like, you know, let's put this kid on electronic monitoring. Uh, let's put him in juvenile detention and stop shootings, you know. Uh, so that was my first kind of uh, coordinated gang kind of ideal, you know, in, in my law enforcement career. And it was working out pretty good uh, till I find myself got to the point where I wanted to be more policey. Like I wanted, I wanted to. I was tired of the social work aspect of things. I wanted to punch a kid in the mouth, you know, like I was, I was done with some of these kids. They, they had, they were running their neck a lot of times and parents, you know, I'm going to houses where they move the front door every week cause they get shot up all the time with, with a pen and a pad, you know, and I'm like, this is stupid. And I had a little, uh, Davis industries 25 with a balsa wood ha handle underneath my, 83 cutlass front seat, you know, I wasn't going to get caught slipping, you know, these kids are shooting and doing all this junk. So I was like, I could at least get back and bust off a couple rounds, you know, get my ass out of danger. But, um, figured that that was frowned upon as a juvenile PO. Uh, and I was, I saw myself migrating towards a more law enforcement mindset. Uh, not that I was getting away from the intervention or prevention side of things. I just, knew I wanted more for myself. Uh, I wanted more action and juvenile probation couldn't do it for me anymore. So I was very appreciative of, of Doug Brown, uh, Elder Catalano. Uh, those, those are the two people that really started my career and kind of encouraged me to go forward, you know, not stay in that, 
realm. So, so I uh, had some friends who were state probation parole officers, felony probation parole. Carried a gun, vest, uh, got a car, uh, and you had every person you dealt with was a felon. You know, it, to me, that was like the ultimate kind of. I think that was going to be the pinnacle of my career. You know, not not police. I was going to be this PO, this high level PO. So the state hired me, uh, and I, I did that for five years. And during that time, I, I that gang track just wouldn't go away. So I uh, I ended up developing because we were still having the same issues in that area in Canyon County. So I developed this gang caseload. It was a specialized caseload of up to a hundred identified gang members or associates. Uh, at the time, there was there were two gang units in the area. There was actually three. There was Boise Police Gang Unit. I worked closely with them. Uh, Napa PD had a gang unit, and Caldwell had a street crimes gang unit. And so I worked with all those units um, and developed this caseload. Uh, so that we could monitor gang activity. Um, it was a high level supervision. So I'm talking about intense, you know, two o'clock in the morning, home visits and uh, search and seizure, you know, uh, uh, searches all the time, uh, rode with gang units uh, to identify, and, you know, utilize the probation services, probation parole services uh, for that, interviews, um, you name it. And also, Intervention. If somebody wanted to get out or away, I, I tried to develop things uh, through our inner workings at the Department of Corrections. Uh, you know, they have like cognitive self change and all these different things to do. But but I wanted it to be focused more on the gang side, so I offered that. But that didn't get used as much as as the more of the punitive side of of uh, supervision. So I was out there doing it, and then I got on this. They put me on a fugitive task force, so I'm chasing people, uh, gunning people down. Like I'm, I'm, I'm copping pretty hard without being a certified cop. I'm a certified PO, so I, I, I'm with my people, but I can't just go out and make you know general arrests and things like that. And so I'm finding that I'm liking tactics a lot more. Uh, so I'm, I'm training with some local SWAT teams doing uh clearing movements things like that i'm liking it a lot uh i'm kicking doors i'm clearing you know houses i'm 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 arresting bad dudes i'm getting in big fights you know uh putting dudes through tables and i mean we it was it was fun it was getting after it and uh all above board of course but uh and then i got threatened from a gang member uh had some family come up from california uh, I got into a fight with him, uh, put the boots on him pretty good. Uh, he got charged with battering an officer on an officer and obviously violations, uh, called some family up and I had an informant. There was an informant that told a gang unit detective, uh, Holland was going to get hit. They knew where my kids went to school. They knew where I lived. Uh, so at that point, FBI got involved, um, uh, Later on, I developed a non-liking of the FBI, but nonetheless, they were they were involved. I had a, a good relationship with them at the time. Uh, Napa PD SWAT, uh, we had a full extraction plan on my house in case something happened while we're going to court for this guy. So that was my first taste of kind of the gang world folding back on me in regards to my work I was doing in that realm. So shortly after that, um, I got a good friend of mine who was in the gang unit, uh, Duggan. I mean, not Duggan, uh, Wadarki. Jeff Wadarki uh, hit me up, says, hey, why don't you come to Boise PD? And honestly, I was like, look, I'm doing a bunch of cop work, but I'm scared of that background. Background and polygraph, like, you know, I've been involved in stuff in California as a, as a, as a kid, you know, not even being a, you know, actual like gang member. Like, man, there's no way they will take me, you know, like I'm a, they look at me as a bad seat. He goes, just, no, just do it. You, you'll, we need good guys like you. I, I felt honored that people thought I would be a good police officer, even though I never thought of myself as, as being that. So molded over, 
mold it over and decided oh, I'm gonna take the chance. And so I did it, um, went through the process, <laughs> went through my uh, polygraph and it was like, there's no way I'm gonna pass this thing. Like I, I told the truth, but that's why I thought they would go, uh, no, we're done with you at this point. Uh, I was in a car for two drive-by shootings, you know, uh, you know, I stole a car when I was young, you know, did all this stuff. I'm like, you're not going to tell me. I did a burglary on a pizza joint, you know. I mean, just, I'm like, man, there's no way they're going to take me. Uh, and I remember Roger Bird to this day, God bless that man's heart. He, uh, he went outside to have a smoke break and said, Brian, we would be thrilled to have you as a police officer. And I almost fainted. I was like, man, there's no way. So got that far, then got to the psyche valve. And I go see Jamie Champion in the psyche phone. I have to take the 1600 question test. You know, they ask you reverse questions and all this weird junk to figure out if you're crazy. And so I, I take the, the test. She pulls me in her office and she goes, based on your test, I can't. There's no way I can sign off on you. And I go, what are you talking about? This is the last step. Like I've been months of this junk, you know, got the conditional offer. I'm like, yeah, ready to go. She goes, uh, based on your test results, your written test results, you, I would diagnose you with PTSD. And that time I didn't even know what PTSD was. I knew it, I thought it had something to do with military. I was like, I was never in the military. How could I have something like that? I don't even know what that is. So she described what it was. And she was, your childhood was so traumatic. I, I would have to, I would be hard pressed to sign off on you to go carry a gun and go do So I've been carrying a gun for five years already. I've been doing work for five years already. So she goes, but there's a way to do, you know, to handle this. So uh, I had to do a series of interviews with her. Like, look at this ink blotter and tell me what it is, you know, stuff like that. I'm like, I, butterfly, you know? <laughs> and then there was the, I remember specifically there was one, there was a girl, she looked like a young girl in a park holding an apple like this. And a guy with a hood walking past her. And she goes, what do you see here? I said, she's about to get jacked for the apple. And she goes, no, you can't. And I go, what else would I think of that? <laughs> so she was trying to like mold me into this. Not everything's bad. Not everything, you know, get away from your childhood to be this. I'm like, hey, you tell me what the hell I need to do to make sure I got this job. So ultimately she said, absolutely. I would get on the stand if you ever had, you know, whatever, a questionable shoot that you're a, you're, you're a competent person. I said, no, thank God. Anyway, so I get on that after all that storied stuff and training was cool. I actually did. I felt like I did good. I think my time with probation, parole and with juvenile probation really set me up for that radio talk, orientation, um, report writing, you know, things of that, that nature. And it allowed me to just be me, you know? Uh, so I'm not a big ticket writer. Uh, I hate DUIs. Wasn't great at those. Um, but I actually, made it through training and they asked me what I thought I needed or if I was ready to go. And I actually prescribed myself to DUIs because I, I felt that I shaded myself from that. So when with the DUI team for a while, did a couple of those. My last training officer, Officer Maki, one of my great friends now, he we basically rode as a two man car at the end. It was cool. I mean, we went on hot calls and he's a hard charge like me, ex boxer, you know. Uh, and so we went out there and just made it happen um but he also pulled me out of my out of my cover i had i had issues being a black officer i, I had issues being an officer who was black uh, i knew people in the community i knew uh, people that weren't so savory you know um and good people you know that you know black people that knew me and i knew as soon as i would have this job i would lose some of those relationships i would lose even my familial relationships, like I go home, my, I go back to California and I get through courtesy 15 minutes. They know I'm a cop and they, for some reason they think I'm going to descend upon them and, and arrest them for the, the crack they're slaying. Like, I, I can't do anything to you. I don't give two shits, you know, but uncles, cousins, all that. Hey, great to see you. Oh, look at the time. You don't even have a watch on, you know, boom, they leave, you know, it's cool. I was, I was okay with that. Uh, it was the people that I had relationships here in the valley that was a little harder, uh, and over time it it made itself evident even in my 
extremely close relationship, like my daughter. Uh, so I'll get into that later, I guess. But um, but Mati saw that, and he pulled me out of that cover and made me deal with people away from color and about the the law. What's the law? Not the laws it applies to the hood, not the laws it applies to black people or Mexican people. What's the law? Did they not use their blinker? Write him a ticket. So one day he made me, I, I wasn't a ticket writer. I was an action hound. Like, let's go to this hot call. You know, let's go to this assist. Let's do these things. Pull guns, fights, stuff like that. He told me one day we got in the car the last couple of days. He goes, you're going to write every violation you see. That was the most... That that killed me. I hated giving those tickets to those people. Like seriously, hated it. I'm the like master warner. I warn everybody, you know. Uh, but he, I see why he did it. I needed to address that piece of my my policing uh, to be a thorough officer, you know. Uh, so I appreciate him for that. Um, getting out of training, and at that time, the Hollywood team, the bar team. So it was a directed patrol specifically for the downtown core of the bar, the bars in downtown Boise. They were well-known, Hollywood team. Everybody looks like a Adonis, uh, you know, strong, tactical, just a rough, tough group of, of people uh, that I had the pleasure of knowing and working with as a PO. They knew me. They, they kind of groomed me to come to the department. So I was, I was very pleased to know that team. You were appointed to that team at that time. Captain would come down and say, hey, I'm putting you on the bar team because that's, there was a certain type you needed down there, right? Not that I was some tough, rumble tug, you know, rough and tumble guy, but I, I felt like I could get down and, and that would be the place to be. I would like that. And so he caught me and just before we were getting assigned where we were going. And Captain Miller caught me on the stairs at Barrister when we were actually at Barrister at the time. And said, Holland, you ready to go to the bar team, to the Hollywood team? And I, I just remember glowing, like, if I could have said, I'd be like, fuck yeah, I am, you know, like, but yes, sir, you know, I'm absolutely. And he goes, all right, I heard, I heard great things. Let's get down there and do it. And, and that, that was my calling, uh, going down there. I worked it for almost five years. Uh, and I, I, I did it well. I felt like I had a good, number one, I had great people. I worked with one of my best friends, Kevin Holtry. He taught me the ropes, Coy Bruner, some legit dudes, like how we wore our uniforms, my white shirt poking out, you know, LAPD kind of style, you know, it, 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 it transcended upon people. Like dudes didn't come down there flying colors and became an AFC down there of an acting field commander. Uh, so I kind of ran the team for, for some time uh, because of my time on it. Uh, developed some good relationships down there, uh, actually developed some quality informants that aided me in my next chapter um, when it came to working gangs and stuff. Uh, documented and uh, FI'd a grip of gang members. I mean, that was, that was my thing because I knew, I knew I had a track. When I came to that department, there was two things I was going to do. I was going to go to the gang unit well, first, I was going to be on the SWAT team. I wanted to be a SWAT team member, period, hands down. And I was going to be in the gang unit. Those are the two things I knew. Didn't want to work narcs. Didn't want to do... I, I liked working narcotic cases, but I did not want to be a narco. I wanted to be gang unit. Uh, and I wanted to straight up learn tactics. I wanted to be a tactical whiz. So I, I tried to get myself on every hot call I could, work tactics. Um, and I got the opportunity, uh, to test for SWAT team, got it my first time out and I was on cloud nine. I was going to be the next, that was going to be the rest of my career. I was going to be on that team. I loved it. Uh, and I was there almost 15 years, uh, body gave out on me. So, and then after that, it was, I wanted to put my appropriate time in. I wanted to, I wanted five years in patrol. I wanted to, to do that. And then I had that five years with PMP. So I felt like I had a pretty rounded, uh, street time, uh, to go to detectives gang unit at the time was a detective position. And so I tested, uh, for gang unit and got it hands down. Like I had, I had, I had numerous FI on gang members. 
I had the lingo down. I had uh, the mission down. I had it all. I had I had everything it took. I thought, and I'm kind of to my own horn, but I I felt I was the prototypical gang cop. Um, you know, had the background, um, had the kind of the flair for it, and the know how, and so it, it made me. It was perfect. Uh, and so yeah, got in as a as a gang unit. And my career was, in my mind, my career was like enviable. Gang unit, detective, I'm wearing Raiders hats and Dickies and Chuck Taylors, you know, pro club long tees. I'm, I, I, I'm able to dress like I would dress. Um, and then we'd go out in uniform and I'd look sharp in my uniform, gang unit, you know, gang unit pin or whatever. Uh, I'm out enforcing, I'm making contacts with people, uh, I'm developing uh, snitches and, and making cases, made the first ever uh, buy program through the gang unit for uh, narcotics, uh, first ever illegal weapons program uh, through, the, through the gang unit. I was proud of that. I was proud that we could hold it on. We were housed out there with Bandit, uh, the nar narcotics. And so I was holding my own with them. And I always got asked. I remember DEA, when I went through DEA basic, I can't remember the big dude's name, big bald guy worked for DEA. When I went through basic, uh, we had to do like a, a mock. They were, they were showing you how you whip up crack. And I was kind of telling them how I knew how to do it <laughs> from the neighborhood. And they were kind of tripping on that. And then, uh, and then we had to do these scenarios and I remember working the scenario and the the DEA guy pulls me aside and he goes, how long, what in the fuck are you doing gang work for? Why aren't you in a narcotic unit? I'm like, I, man, I, I can do it all in the gang unit, you know? And I could still do gang stuff, but I could do dope stuff as well. So it was like everything. I could work theft cases with the gang unit. I could work homicide. I could work all kinds of stuff. Uh, but narcotics was my main thing. And I did these buy programs. Um, till I got to the pinnacle of my gang unit career, uh, we were chopping down big gangs and I started working with, uh, being at, at DEA and, 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 uh, my great friend, uh, Jenna McGuire at ATF. And that was like, that was everything. We were, we were, we had it going on, man. We had the whole angle. We were, we were kidding it. We were. Jenna would call me at two o'clock in the morning. We'd go slap a tracker on a car. Or, you know, we'd be, we'd be interviewing all three of us, you know, gang leaders, you know, and they're talking about where they hid their guns and, you know, how, and, and going to get, I mean, we were making cases and pissing people off. I loved it. Loved it. It was a hard life uh, when you piss off every three letter agency in the, in the area. But nonetheless, we, 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 we killed it. Uh, yeah, in that time, got into a shooting with a gang member. Uh, my close friend, one of my best friends, like a brother to me, uh, lost both his legs. Um, two of our, you know, members were shot. So that was a that was a big moment in my SWAT SWAT career and gang unit career. Um, uh, our my, my things started to demise at probably around I would say a year. You're 12 in the unit, uh, maybe even 11, uh, where the city started to show, or not just the city, but it, it boggles my mind, the level of haterism in, in police work. It, it just blows my mind how you could be doing such a good job and people get jealous of it or, or they, they, they sabotage it in some way. And that, that's what, towards the end of my, my gang career, um, it, it just became all sabotage from a very strained relationship with the FBI, uh, strained relationship with DEA. Uh, ATF still had a good relationship, but they internally imploded. Uh, and everybody just hated everybody. Like, it's just amazing. And so you couldn't do work, couldn't do good gang work uh, to the point where I found that I was done. I was done. Uh, I'll never be done working gangs. Or I'll never be done running good tactics, but I was done playing the game. And so recently, 
a uh, year ago, I said quits to the gang unit. Uh, they never filled our spot to me and my good friend, Danny Carter, uh, another great officer, uh, great gang cop, former narc. Um, we, we had a good thing going, but they dwindled us down to two. They put us in a little corner of an obsolete you know, unit. We became obsolete. And so we both said, forget it, we're done. So back on patrol now, uh, loving it. I'm 22 months out before I retire, uh, teaching these youngsters. That's the cool thing. You know, everybody, policing has changed so much with these cameras on our chest and everything's 18 logins. Uh, you know, DUIs went from blowing in a tube to these little, you know, $10,000 machines. Like, uh, cars have changed. Um, uniforms my god uh, I, i'm sickened by uniform situation these outer vests and everybody's got a beard i've always told my daughter don't ever stop for a cop with a beard you if, if a cop is jumping out of their car and they got a baseball hat on the beard drive to the next maverick call 911 uh it is not cop like to me it doesn't look right uh so i wear the old school lapd blue uniform hard badge hard name tag uh white shirt high up on my neck i want that shit that that's a there's a prominent look about that yeah it's changed i i, I and i i try to what's been cool is trying to i have these young guys on my team uh because i went back to the bar team which was cool uh trying but 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 cool and uh these young guys just kind of hang off every word you say you know like how things used to be done, how things should be done. I've taught them to walk to fights. Don't run to a fight. We have a service to people. I always say, man, if a couple goes downtown and some guy grabs the guy's wife's ass or something like that, that dude's going to be mad. That dude's going to want to fight because his wife got assaulted. I want to know that information, right? So if I'm running up to a fight and I'm just taking anybody and everybody who's fighting without getting that information, that's a disservice, right? I know in my world, you should always be prepared to go to jail, right? If you're gonna make, we call them penitentiary chances, right? If I'm gonna take, if I'm gonna do something, I'm not gonna expect some cop to figure it out for me. But I try to do that, so I hold these guys back. These guys are hard charges; they're gonna run every fight. So I hold them. I go, nope, let's walk. Number one, they get tired, right? Number two, I can see who's the aggressor, who's not the aggressor. Uh, and number three, I can maybe figure out a, a little bit. Number one, a strategic plan on how we do it. Number two, what's really going on, you know? And these guys, it's cool when they they take kind of that 20-year experience or 25-year experience and they they inherit it, you know? And so I'm able to do that. Uh, it, it's It's been a good good deal. I'm, I'm going to, my last 22 months, I think I'm going to, I don't want to wish it away. I know it's. I know it goes fast. So, I'm trying to, trying to live it up. So, Brian, um, two questions for you. One is, you started as a probation officer. Do you think that that gave you a different perspective than a normal officer just starting right away as an officer? Yeah, absolutely. It again, it allows you to get a, more in depth with people. I knew everybody I was dealing with was a felon, right? And in my case, when I developed that gang case, well, a pretty bad felon, right? Shooting, stabbings, I mean, more than likely violent stuff. Um, but you get a chance to know their girlfriend, their baby mama, their, their grandmother, their mother. Um, you get to be a little more in depth in their life. Uh, and so that gives you more perspective about people, even though they're felons, right? Even though they're criminals, it's us against them type of thing. Um, I was able to develop that humanity or let my humanity come out and weigh it with tactics, with investigations, all that stuff. It gave me a better, a better play. I, I've gotten a lot of, uh, again, I'm not trying to toot my, my own horn, but it always feels good to me when somebody says, I, I appreciate the way you police. I appreciate the way you're, you're human. I appreciate the way you interact with me. Uh, and yet I can still command respect and still have tactic, tactical reasoning and, and positioning and all those things. But, but, but 
speak a lingo or treat a person in a way that they that, that it knocks down the uniform. And that's that's been my specialty. That's been something I've tried to garner forever. And I think probation, parole, really gave me the chance to uh, hone that in, uh, and then transfer that to you know being a police officer. That that uniform that. Um, I guess sometimes the stigma, you know, of being a cop, um, I was able to knock that down. And so, yeah, I, I, I think the track, God put me on a track that I didn't, you know, we don't know where our life's going to go. You think you do. Um, I thought I had, you know, knew where my life was going. And you start thinking back and go, now I get it, you know, now I see why I went this, this route or, or how it made my route better, you know, um, easier. I, I'm not disgruntled. I don't, I don't, I'm not at work and I'm not motherfucking every, you know, every little thing. I, I do get disenchanted with some things, but, but I look at some guys and it's like, it, it, they, they just don't want to even be anywhere near it anymore. And I understand police sentiment is, is really taking a, a big hit, a big hit, but man, I can still, uh, I can still work it, you know, I can still uh, feel good about working it, you know, and, and so, uh, again, I think I had a softened entry to, to law enforcement, a gradual uh, entry, and I, I think there's something to be said for that. Do you think that your opinion of how you deal with people, how you view society has changed at all? when you first started law enforcement till now? You know, th there's always that. There's ebbs and there's flows uh, with people. The violence is always the same. Uh, I think I think our younger generation is starting to figure out how hands-off we've been with them. And they're, 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 they're pulling our card. You know, it's, uh, they're up in the ante. Uh, this generation, social media generation, you know. So everybody's... A gangster, you know, uh, I, that I have a hard time dealing with that. Um, so, yeah, I I believe I I believe people are always the same. It's always the same stuff. It always it always comes full circle, right? Um, but nationally, I think we just we've lost our flair for the country, right? We've lost our. I look. I work downtown. I look at some of these guys. I'm like, is this the person who's going to go to the army and protect me overseas? Like, hell no. I'll enlist at 50 and go put in some work to make sure that our country's safe. You know, uh, I think we've gotten very, very soft, very soft. Um, some of the stuff that people call the police for, it blows my mind, you know, and I, I talked to him on the phone. Like, you seriously call the police for this? You know, it, it makes zero sense. Uh, uh, and then be the same people who will denounce the police, but you'll call them for because your plumbing doesn't work. You know what I'm saying? Like your 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 cable went off. They'll call nine one one. You know, I mean that's the generation we live in. I come from an era where you you, you didn't call the police. Not that you, I don't, I don't know if it was a dislike thing. It was just a figure it out, you know, type of thing, and, and you call them for what you need them for. You know, and a lot of agencies have really kind of jump-started that. Like, look, we're not coming to these type of calls anymore. You, you look at, we got a guy that just came from New York. Um, he, every car, two-man car, every call is a high-priority call that they go to. That's it. These uh, uh, custodial interferences between, t no, you go in, you go file that with some desk person, you know, that's some 28-year dude who, you know, is going to be like, yep, give me... Because they're time consuming and we still offer those services as a, as a police department, you know, it's hard to keep that level of service up, especially when you're 35, 50 officers, you know, down. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, that's probably the overriding deal, but everything man, downtown always the same. It's expanded. It's become a bigger entertainment uh, uh, deal. My issue with the say Boise downtown because it's changed and gotten bigger and expanded, but yet we stay the same, that's not good practice. That that's in my mind, you're you're part of the problem. You're not expanding with that. 
Um, and you just get lucky because Boise doesn't have, it's not Southside Chicago with shootings every day, you know. So, but you need to be smart enough to say, we don't want that. So therefore, we're going to do this. There's a lot of bad examples out there and nobody tends to look at that, especially on the administrative side. I don't get it. That administration scares me because I've seen some good people fall hard to the stupidity of administrations. Like I got, I look at them going, are you serious? Did you think this when you were an actual cop, you know, that to, this is how to do job, the, the job. And so it, it always worries me. Like, is there something that happens like mechanically in your brain? As soon as you become an administrator, you're like, Bad. you know, you're stupid all of a sudden, you know, like I, I would hope I would never be that way, but I won't have a chance to know. So we, um, you mentioned this a little bit earlier on, um, and we've talked about this before, but becoming a law enforcement officer um, as somebody who's black, uh, we talked about, you had mentioned something about kind of pulling a black card. You pull your black card a little bit, but you, you had alluded a little bit um, about the relationship changes and specifically with your daughter. Yeah. Can, you, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, the George Floyd... Uh, that whole thing just, that hurt big time. My daughter, uh, my daughter was, me and my daughter have always been very close. Uh, she's always, I always felt like she revered me. Um, and she came up pretty conservative. Uh, our household was, you know, uh, you know, firearms were around. Um, you know, she, she was great on school. She went to a public school that had gang issues and all this kind of stuff, but she, she stayed her course, was able to uh, get a scholarship. And as soon as she went to Southern California for school, uh, the, the bad sentiment for police officers just started to take seed. And it came to a head on the George Floyd deal where, uh, well, even before that, I, we would have talks and I could hear her perspective changing. But I was okay. It, it, it was categorized as we need more cops like you, Dad. But these other cops suck, you know. Gotcha. But that's pretty general, right? Uh, and I tried to explain it to her. She was becoming, a, she was going to be a doctor, and she was, but she kind of changed it. Nursing. I go imagine if I took the nurses that have stole medication, killed people, either. Uh, wantingly or by accident, uh, misdiagnosed, mistreated, anything like that. And I said, man, nurses suck just because of them. That's not fair. And, and so we'd have to have these, these, these talks about it. And then the George Floyd deal came up and my daughter straight out, uh, wouldn't talk to me, just stopped talking to me because of my profession. Um, even though that was, I denounce that, you know, that's not policing. That's a, that's a, that's a guy who's not using uh, tactics and how things need to be as you deal with any suspect, uh, child molester, murderer, theft, you know, a thief, you, 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 these, there's tactics you use and, and the way things are written up to, to treat people the right way, even in arrest. And I told her that, and she, decided to not talk to me for for some time she began to her sentiment for police began to become worse certain posts she would make uh she actually turned down a scholarship from the fraternal order of police uh for her nursing degree she was able to get a, a scholarship uh turned it down uh, didn't tell me either uh, so that that was kind of a surprise when i found out uh to the point where um she she kind of excommunicated herself from me, took her uh, finances. Uh, I, I taught her well, you know, I taught her how to take care of herself. And so if she wasn't going to take money because of my profession, then, then I couldn't, couldn't see fit to pay her cell phone bill or her car insurance or, you know, be on my insurance anymore because those are all police provided, you know? And so she understood that. And she, the one thing I, I respected about my daughter is in her conviction that she was raised right, that she knew the, the, the consequences for her actions and she prepared herself for them, which I got to give her credit for that. 
And it's just been the last couple of years that we have totally mended that relationship. Um, we don't talk about police stuff. I think she still feels a certain way about police, uh, but she respects me and my career and uh, we love each other. And that's above all, but there were, there was a year or so where that was, there was nothing. There was, there was bad sentiment from, from my baby girl, you know, holding my little girl in my hands. This girl wouldn't talk to her daddy, you know, wouldn't, um, wouldn't show any love to him, wouldn't anything, nothing, you know? And so, uh, that was, that was a hard time. And I, and, and I'm not the only one I know of, I mean, Kevin Holsby, my best friend, uh, his daughter still doesn't talk to him, still feels, and this man was shot in the line of duty, lost both his legs, is paralyzed, and she hates him for being a cop. Uh, it, you can't wrap your head around that stuff, you know? So, yeah, that was difficult. And then as a, as a black cop, and obviously I, I'm very light-skinned. I've always been light-skinned. Uh, I get confused of being a, a Polynesian, Samoan, Tongan. Uh, I've gotten confused of being, you know, Hispanic sometimes. I mean, different stuff. But nonetheless, people that know, know that I, I'm a black officer. And it, it's it's difficult. When I talk to a group of, of black men from a church about the George Floyd deal, um, I, and they all respect me as a cop, uh, they had no bad sentiment toward me. So I think it was hard for them to wrap their head around all cops are bad, you know, they, 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 but... They just could not unhinge themselves from these occurrences that happen. That not the million contacts the cops have every day where, where nothing happens, that you know, things actually go great or an officer gets hurt. But these group of contacts that happened that were so high profile, you can't get your un unwrap your head around it. And so the only thing I could tell them because they wanted perspective from me. They wanted perspective. And so I, I was in uniform. I told them, here's the deal. The only way that you can get past an officer, issues with officers, because we can't hire robots. We're all human beings, right? We go through months and months of testing to make sure that you're not going to be the next Rampart scandal or the next scorpion team you know you know beat down we go through all this stuff to make sure that you are going to be a good uh and just a just a great a great officer the only way you can combat that is become an officer yourself and i got laughed at i said i hear you i, I used to do the exact same thing but who better to police your community than you. Who better to deal with Dave over here who's selling dope on your block than somebody that is a group of his peers that say, don't do that no more, that can enforce laws? That Who else will do it? Otherwise, there's a good old white boy out there that's ready to get paid to do it in your neighborhood. And you deal with whatever that is. You know what I'm saying? Whether they don't, they don't understand you or you can't see eye to eye, or God forbid, they live behind that badge and they take it out on you. I mean, that's on you. The only way to combat that is police your own community. And that kind of stopped them in their tracks a little bit, but, you know, and again, I said, I, I get it. I never thought I'd be in this position, ever. And it, and here I am, you know? So it's, uh, it's always difficult. Um, you still hear, especially downtown, you know, you're not black anymore. You're blue, you know. You and and now even more after this recent deal in uh, uh, was it Nashville or whatever, where those black officers did that. Um, people they can't understand it, and so they they just want to go hard on police. And so I had to tell everybody, I go, there's two things you just got to understand about that that situation. Five black officers putting the whoop down on another black a dude, a criminal, or somebody they believe was a criminal. Number one. There's no supervisor. That comes down to supervision, period. If there's somebody to say, no, we ain't doing that, it doesn't get done. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is 
you got to understand the gang members, and that's what we'll categorize them as. Gang members hate police. That's their number one enemy. Even if they have a natural rival, the common denominator of hatred between two rival gangs is the police. But anytime a gang member can be police and a gang member, that's the cat's meow, man. That's top dog shit right there. Because now you got you you can do anything you want in your mind. That's what those five dudes are. Those are weed smoking, bottle tipping, gang member cops. No supervision. Worst rampart scandal, New Orleans. You, you name any big city that's had an issue like that, I bet you you had those those issues. So we talked about this before, but how do you prevent that from happening? You you got to keep your hiring standards up. I mean, as simple as that, you know. Um, like Rampart, if I'm not mistaken, I think some of those dudes uh, went to SC, played ball. So just because they went to SC, played ball, doesn't mean that they didn't come from – like. Take me, for example. I came from a gang area. I was in my background. I'm in the car during two drive-by shootings. I mean, those are things you got to look at to go, am I going to have this issue with this person? Um, do I have a criminal record? No. You know, do how long ago is that? You got you to take these things in perspective because the, ultimately you want to hire people with knowledge, but not too much knowledge, right? You want to hire, you want to hire somebody that understands criminals, but not a criminal. And that's a fine line you got to walk. That's an individual basis. When you blanket and go, we'll take GEDs, and we'll do the softest background to get numbers, you lose, and you'll get these situations um, because ultimately, they're already scheming and you know criminalizing police. So what's the best thing to do? You get on specialized units that have a lot more leeway, less supervision, and a lot more toys. This ain't the only ass whooping these fools put on people. This, this is a common occurrence. This cat just happened to die. That's the only reason it's getting any attention. That scorpion unit beat people bad. Just not, they just found one dude that couldn't take that ass whooping and die. And then it became this big deal. So. It, hiring standards are big. And I always use myself as an example because, it, honestly, if I look back on hiring me, I don't think I'd be hired today. There's no way. I really believe that they would go, nope, sorry. You, you just, your background. And then even if I did make it and I got a, a psychologist who says, you have PTSD for the way you grew up, I think our department would go, nope, not even taking a chance on that. That's an absolute... I'm blessed to be able to have gotten on and do the work I did and be able to work a gang unit and work it with morals uh, and, and, and some type of um, clarity to know that I always held, and you know, you worked with me, I, I held my line when it came, what's the gang angle on this? How do we do the gang? The, the, how do I implement the gang mission? If not, it's gone for me. You know, I, I, I had ethics uh, and I didn't develop those ethics. I had those ethics. So I needed somebody to see that when they hired me. Today, I think you got two ways of hiring. You're very, very stringent because you don't want any scandal whatsoever. And so you lose good people. You lose good people that could be very good cops that are naturally cop oriented or investigative oriented. Or you hire anybody and everybody to fill boxes and you get this, you get that kind of scandal, uh, criminalization of, of, of police. So I think you got to take, uh, you got to have good people that are hiring that can read people uh, without quotas and take the best person. I'd rather go in, you know, I'd rather have the best 10 dudes on a, SWAT team that requires 24 people, but I have these 10 guys that are the absolute best at what they do, and I'd rather go slower and more methodical with those 10 than 24 guys that, that can just fill a hallway.
Does that make sense? Yeah. I want that quality over over just filling the streets, you know. So, so not knowing anything about the background of the Scorpion guys myself, right? But knowing how you just described the way you grew up, why do you think? Why do you think you became the officer that you did, as opposed to the guys that are in Nashville that went sideways? I think uh, for me, there's a, a morality that I, I had um, have. <clears throat> it, look, I, I've been rules. I mean, I've done that before, right? I say choice words to people. Uh, but that's I've also used that in a very real way that's allowed me to get closer to people and deal with situations better. But it's still, per se, policy violations. If I say fuck or, you know call somebody a dumbass or, you know, do, do things like that. Uh, and to be in a, a unit like a gang unit where I had my own car and I had leeway of time, uh, I, I made it a point to be supervised. I wasn't the easiest to supervise, but to be supervised. Right. So I, my, my supervisor knew things cause I didn't want that. Um, I didn't think it would be in me to be a criminal in that position, but anybody can get swayed, right? And I've seen it happen to good dudes that you would never think that would be the case. But if you give somebody too much of something, too much leeway, too much freedom, too much, uh, those things seep in. And um, I, I never wanted that. I never wanted even the opportunity to come up. So I, I worked closely with my supervisors. I made sure that I was being supervised. Not that they didn't try to supervise me, but there are times when you do have a lot of leeway. And so I made sure that I was supervised, right? I didn't want that. So it's like drinking, you know? I, I have to consciously think about my, my alcohol intake. I can drink a lot. I, I, it runs in my family. So I got to consciously think about how many times did I drink this week? How often do I want to be doing that? What am I going to do when I retire and don't have a day job, you know, right away, you know, things like that. I have, you have to self assess. Um, and that's one thing that I believe either. I believe I got that from my mother through religion, uh, and was able to carry that into my job where I did have the leeways and freedoms that could have been exploited. And I was able to ha keep that from, keep me from exploiting it. Uh, by self-assessing. Uh, I remember learning when I first got hired, it was, uh, what was it called? I'm trying to think now. It's, it's basically a, a technique of, of self-assessing, right? Um, being your own caretaker, knowing when, knowing when you need to check yourself. And I've had to do that in multiple situations. Uh, probably two of the biggest ones were giving up my gang career and giving up SWAT. I knew it, I didn't want to. I could still go out there and kill myself and run a test with two fake knees, but where are my fake knees gonna be in 10 years, right? I, I mean, I have to self-assess these things. I love that team to the day I die, it's tattooed on my body. But I had to make a decision, you know, that a long-term decision, a self-assessment of those things. Um, I wish I could remember the phrase. It, uh, it was a, actually a curriculum we got taught when we first got uh, hired, but, <clears throat> Um, yeah, so, so having that ability and hopefully people seeing that ability and then also making myself be supervised, make sense? Um, that stops that, that garbage. Um, I think cause, cause man, we all have it. Everybody's a center, man. Everybody's got, everybody's got that little tweak in them that they go, oh, I can take this or I can do that. We're human, you know? Um. And if you got nothing there to check it, it's going to happen. So uh, that was my whole deal. I knew I came from that, right? I came, I come from a, a, a crack addicted father who, you know, sold pounds and pounds of cocaine. I'd walk out in my, my, our garage and I'd see a pile of cocaine and him and my uncle packaging it up, getting it down, you know, getting ready to, to move it. Uh, I had police raid my house. I'm in the bathtub with my cousin. Yeah, yeah, flipping water. And police come in, laying everybody down, right? 
shit I would end up doing years and years later. I was victim of, you know, to those things, uh, shootings and, uh, just the demise, you know, you know, my aunt, like my other aunt on fire because she stole her crack rock, you know, just, just the demise of people. Um, you walk away from that stuff and Jamie champion, good on her, whatever this test showed that shit, this might be somebody you need to meet with for a while. You know, I get it. It was traumatizing to me to go through that because I'm like, damn, am I that messed up? You know, do I even want to try this? But, but those little things are like, those are the things that get you, uh, I guess that reset you, you know, and then, and then, Assessing yourself, going through a divorce, assessing myself, right? Pulling back from things and people, um, recognizing habits, bad habits, you know, and dealing with those. Uh, loss of my son, you know, from the same thing, heroin, drugs, um, assessing myself. Where am I at? You know, how do I now go out and deal with an overdose? Does it affect me? Does I do do I risk my job because I'm affected by my son overdosing in a halfway house? You know, those are things that I had to check. Uh, so I've always used counseling, uh, the free counseling they give us. I've had some good good interactions with that because I always know that there's that little there's that shadow in my in my head, right? And I could easily start stepping into that shadow. Um, if I'm not self-checked and I can't depend on you as my buddy or my wife or my child, I can't depend on them to, to pull me from that shadow or to keep me from that shadow. Right. It has to be me. Um, and so I've, I developed that way to do that. And, that, and I think it's been, I'm proud to say that I've never succumbed to stuff like that. You know, that I actually, it actually, we recently had an officer who did, uh, came from California, worked on the Metro Violent Crime Task Force, was working as a part of our unit, and lo and behold, it comes out, he's uh, getting paid by a prison gang, he's providing information, a prison, this prison gang wants to kill me, they don't like me, I've been working them for, I'm working for 15 years, and this dude's doing dirty shit, you know, and He's, he's fucking an informant and providing information that this gang uses. It got put cops in jeopardy. Not only do I feel confident in myself on how I conducted myself and with all that leeway and freedom, I even now want to, you know, I want to take aggression out on this dude for being a dirty cop. You know, uh, that feels good. There's no sympathy for that, you know. Brian, thank you for chatting with me. Yeah, I appreciate it.